I'm here, my name is Anandi, as you would know, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the subject of uh, criminal law. Criminal law is a compulsory subject that you have to study in the um, University of London or the BAC Diploma in Law syllabus, because uh, criminal law is considered one of the core subjects that you need to do in, in the UK for a UK law degree, yeah? So criminal law, as you would all imagine, is rather interesting, okay? Because, you know, you watch um, Suits, I'm sure, more recently. And if you're closer to my age, you probably would have watched LA Law. And all this creates a very interesting, sexy view of criminal law. But I am actually here to sort of burst your bubble because I'm going to tell you that when we're looking at the study of criminal law, we are actually looking at the theory of criminal law, yeah? And when you look at the theory of criminal law, what we're looking at is the question of when is a crime committed as opposed to the practice of criminal law that deals with the question of how is a crime committed, all right? How to prove the commission of a crime. Now, that's interesting. Not just interesting, it's also really important, yeah? Because a person cannot be convicted of a criminal offence unless you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he has committed a particular crime. But unfortunately, when you're studying criminal law, you're looking at the theory and you're asking the question of when is the crime committed? And to answer that question, when is a crime co committed? We need to know what are the requirements of a crime and are those requirements satisfied, all right? Now, when you're looking at evidence, Evidence is important to how is a crime committed. Now, as I said, evidence is important, but that is a separate subject in itself. In the theory, you're studying the question of when. When is a crime committed? Okay? Now, when is a crime committed? Now, if you look at the language that I have here on my screen, you would see that this is not language that you're familiar with. You don't watch it on TV. It was definitely never mentioned in suits or in LA law, okay? The term actus reas, mens rea, you don't see this kind of language. Now, the reason is, okay, again, I reiterate, the actus reas is the guilty act. The mens rea is the guilty mind, and both of this combined makes an offence, makes criminal offence, okay? Now, sometimes a person, so for, a, for the simplest example, all right, if I took a gun, okay, and held it against your head and pulled the trigger, and as a result of which you died, I have committed the actus reus of murder because I have caused your death. And if I held a gun to your head and pulled the trigger, at the very least, I have, and well, not at the very least, I very clearly have an intention to kill you. So I've done the guilty act. I have the guilty mind. Now that's murder. But let's say for the sake of argument, the reason why I held that gun against your head and pulled the trigger was because course, okay, you were about to kill me. You had a gun pointed at me and it was a question of who pulled the trigger first. So when I pulled the trigger to kill you, I actually did it in self-defense. So I killed you, I caused your death, I had an intention to kill you, but the reason why I did it is because of self-defense. So now we can no longer say that I have no defense. So if I did the actus reus with the mens rea without a defense, then it is a crime. But if I do the actus reus with the mens rea with a defense, then it doesn't amount to a crime. All right. So a crime, when you're looking at, okay, so if I said earlier, the requirements for an offense, what are these requirements? These requirements are actus reus, mens rea, no defense. Now, as I said, actus reus, mens rea, these are Latin terms, and this is not language that you would have read about or seen. But this is the language that you would need to know in the study of criminal law. 
All right, you will need to know what is the actus reus of a crime, what is the mens rea, and are these requirements satisfied in any given situation, okay? So let me give you an example, an example of this difference, the difference between theory and practice. And, and I use this example very often because it shows you very clearly the difference between what we're studying and the actual practice of criminal law, all right? Now, the offense that I'm going to be looking at is the offense of theft. And this is also part of your syllabus. You will be studying this much later in the day, all right? Now, theft is defined by section one, subsection one of the Theft Act of 1968, okay? Now, criminal offenses in the UK are mainly found in acts of parliaments like this, okay? The Theft Act determines the offense of theft. Um, the Criminal Damage Act determines offences of uh, damaging property. Offences against the Persons Act deals with causing harm, okay? The only offence actually that you would be looking at that is not defined by any Act of Parliament is murder. Murder is a definition that is not found in any Act of Parliament. It is what we call a common law definition, a definition that was given by a judge and that has been used till today, all right? So let's look at theft very quickly. Now, section one, subsection one of the theft act defines the offense and it says that anyone who dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it commits the offense, commits theft, okay? Now, and the requirements I told you is the actus reus and mens rea. Now, where does this come from? It comes from this definition, all right? So I've got that definition again, okay? Anyone who dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it, okay? Now I've broken that up into the actus reus and the mens rea, all right? So if you look at it from the definition, the actus reus is appropriation of property belonging to another. So that's the guilty act. The guilty mind is dishonesty and an intention to permanently deprive the other of it. I'm sorry, it sort of got messed up there. It's an intention to permanently deprive the other of it. So there are one um, act requirement, which is the appropriation. What do you need to appropriate? You need to appropriate property belonging to another. The mens rea requirement is actually two, dishonesty and an intention to permanently deprive the other of it, okay? So let me give you an example. Now, A, he walks into the supermarket, similar to the, the, the picture that I have put up there. He walks into the supermarket. He looks around to make sure that there is no CCTV camera aimed at him. There is nobody watching him. He makes sure that he's all alone and his back is turned to anyone who's there. And he takes a bar of chocolate from the shelf and he puts it to the jacket pocket and he walks out of the shop without paying for it, okay? So what has he done? This is very simple, this is stealing, am I right? You take a bar of chocolate, you walk out of the supermarket without paying for the bar of chocolate, that is stealing, simple, all right? Now, my question here is, and this is what in the exam you would have to look at, is when does he commit the offense of theft? Now, there are two instances where this could be done. It was either at the point when he took the bar of chocolate and put it into his pocket or at the point when he walked out of the shop without paying for it. So he takes the bar of chocolate, that's one, and he put, walks out of the shop without paying for it. And as a student, you would be required to actually answer that question, okay? Now, let me explain to you how that works, all right? So, let me go back. Okay, so... When A took the bar of chocolate and he put it into his jacket pocket, what did he do? He appropriated. Appropriated in its simplest term means to take. To take property that belongs to another. So when he took the bar of chocolate and he put it into his pocket, he took property belonging to another. Now the mens rea requirement for you to be guilty and both the actus reus and mens rea must occur at the same time for a person to be criminally liable, all right? So 
if you look at the actor's rears, he took it and he put it into his pocket. Now, the men's rear requirement is dishonesty and an intention to permanently deprive the other of it. Those are the two men's rear requirements. Now, let's look at it. When he put it into his jacket pocket, was he dishonest? Yes, he had no intention to pay. Now, did he intend to permanently deprive the owner of the property? Again, yes, because when he put it into his jacket pocket without an intention to pay, that is an intention to permanently deprive the owner of the property. So if you look at it, when he put it into his pocket, jacket pocket, he appropriated property belonging to another, plus he had the necessary menstrual. He was dishonest. And he had an intention to permanently deprive. Now that is theft. So when did he commit the offence? He committed the offence when he put it into his jacket pocket. Okay? Now a lot of you would have thought that the offence was actually made out when he walked out of the shop without paying for it. Okay? Now that is important because that is evidence. Okay, so in reality, okay, when will they nab you? They won't nab you in the shop. They won't even if the CCTV camera was watching you and you put it into your jacket pocket or the security was watching you hidden behind a shelf and he saw you put it into the jacket pocket, he wouldn't stop you until you leave the shop. Why? Because that is evidence proof that you had no intention to pay, okay? Because if now somebody stopped this guy and said, hey, you're stealing, I would say, how would you know? I haven't left the shop yet. I might be, I'm going to pay at the counter. I can put it anywhere. I can put it in my pocket. I can hold it in my hand. I can put it into the basket. I can put it anywhere. You shouldn't care where I put it. You should only care if I pay for it. And he's right evidentially we cannot prove that he committed the offense until he walks out of shop because then that is proof that he did not have an intention to pay okay now in theory when did he commit it when he put it into his jacket pocket so you see what i mean when we study the theory of criminal law that's what we're studying. And this is a similar exam question where the examiner will ask you. He saw that there was the no CCTV cameras around. He put it into his jacket pocket. And as the student, you are required to tell the examiner that because the elements, the requirements of the offense, the actus reus and the mens rea is made out, at that point, the offense is made out. So when is the offense made out? When he put the jacket when he put the chocolate into his jacket pocket. Can you see that? That's the difference between theory and practice, okay? Now, let's say, for example, the reason why he went in and he stole those chocolates was because somebody outside was holding a gun to his son's head and said, okay, if you don't steal the bar of chocolates, that he would kill a son or he would cause serious harm to a son, okay? Now, and if that is the reason why A went into the supermarket and stole the uh, chocolate, then although he still has the actus reus and mens rea, now he has a defense, okay? And that defense is called duress, duress of threats. If somebody is holding a gun to your child's head and threatening harm to him, serious harm to him, and asks you to commit an offense, you have the defense of duress of threats, okay? So although he did commit the offense because he did the actus reus and he had the mens rea, because of this defense, because of duress of threats, threats, his actions will be excused and he will not be criminally liable, all right? So it reiterates the point that actus reus plus mens rea without a defense amounts to a crime. Actus reus plus mens rea with a defense doesn't amount to a crime. All right? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do with you next is I'm going to give you a, just a simple teaser of a criminal law exam question and how a student is required to approach an exam question. All right? 
So here we have the question, okay? A comes home early from work one day and he finds his wife B in bed with the gardener, C. Furious, okay? He rushes into the kitchen, he takes a sharp knife and he stabs C with it, all right? C, as a result, okay, of being stabbed, he's rushed to the hospital, okay, because A might have been overcome with remorse after stabbing C. And C is then rushed to the hospital where the doctor tells him that he requires a blood transfusion to live. And C says he doesn't, C refuses the blood transfusion, okay, he's barely conscious, but he refuses a blood tr tr transfusion. And because he refused a blood transfusion, he dies. The doctor tells him he requires a blood transfusion to live. He refuses a blood transfusion. Clearly, because of that refusal, he dies. Okay. So now we have to consider A's criminal liability. All right. Now, A has stabbed C. C was taken to the hospital. He required a blood transfusion. He said no. He died. All right. So the ultimate consequence of A's actions here is that C has died. So we now have to consider, okay, what offense can we charge A with, okay? Are the requirements, are the elements of the offense laid out, i.e. is the actus reus made out, is the mens rea made out, and over and above that, does A have any defense? So essentially, this is how you answer an exam question. What are the offenses? Are those offences satisfied on the facts? Are the elements satisfied on the facts? Are there any defences on the facts? And can the defendant rely, can the accused rely on those defences? Okay, so let's look at this in a bit more detail. All right, so because A has died, the sorry, C has died, the consequence, okay, is death and therefore a will be charged with the offense of murder, okay? Now, you remember I told you earlier, murder is one of the very few offenses that we will be studying that is not defined by any act of parliament, okay? It was actually a definition that was given by a judge in the 17th, 18th century. And till today, we use that definition, but we no longer use the language that is used and some changes have been made along the years, okay? So in a very simple um, definition is unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought. That's the definition for murder, all right? And that definition, as you know, is divided into the actus reus and mens rea, okay? So the actus reus is unlawful killing of a human being and the mens rea is an intention to kill or an intention to cause serious harm, all right? So looking at it again, you can see, all right, is there, uh, the mens rea element is actually what is easy on these facts, right? Okay, because he came home, he was furious when he saw his wife, okay, in bed with the gardener, and, you know, they weren't reading a textbook, obviously, you, we know what they were doing. So he was furious, and he took a knife, and he stabbed C with it, okay? So even if he didn't have an intention to kill, when you take a knife, a sharp knife, and you stab somebody with it, now that is an intention to cause serious harm. Am I right? So malice aforethought is defined as an intention to kill or an intention to cause serious harm. And here, what we do have is an intention to cause serious harm. All right? So the mens rea element is satisfied. Now let's look at the actus rea, and this is where in the exam we call an issue, all right? We have to show that A caused C's death. That is the most important requirement under the actus rea, because for unlawful killing of a human being, you have to show that it was A's act that was the cause of C's death. Now what is our problem here? On these facts, we have a small problem, and that is that Although A stabbed C, A rushed C to the hospital and A got him, you know, medical treatment. But it was C who refused that medical treatment. It was C who refused the blood transfusion and C died. So the question that we have to actually answer is this. Is A's act the cause of C's death or is it C's own act that is the cause of C's death? Now, this is when you have to look at case law and case law will help us determine the answer to that question, all right? Now, we
we have the case of R against Blau. And the case of R against Blau, on very similar facts actually, okay, was he stabbed the victim many times. She refused to have uh, have a blood transfusion because you know she was a Jehovah, a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Okay, the defendant argued that it was the refusal. Okay, that was the cause of death, and therefore the act done by the accused didn't cause the consequence. The act done by the accused caused the harm. The consequence was actually caused by a refusal to consent to the blood transfusion. Therefore, there is a break in the chain of causation. The act must cause the death. The act didn't cause the death. And that's what the defense argued. The courts held, no. The courts held that, look, the wound, the wound inflicted by the accused is still operating as a cause of death. Okay, the judge, he said very clearly, he said, if you ask the question, what is the cause of death? The answer is very clear. It's the stab wounds. And it's similar here. If C hadn't been taken to the hospital, would he have died? Yes. So what caused the death? It was A's act of stabbing C. Can you see that? So from that, okay, we can see that the act of A stabbing C is the cause of C's death. Okay. So is the actus reus element satisfied? Yes. So earlier we said the mens rea wasn't a problem. We said an intention to cause grievous bodily harm at the very least. The only issue was, did A's act cause C's death? And looking at the case of R against Blau, and you would learn all this. You will learn the cases. You would learn how to look at, look for the cases. All of this will be taught in the syllabus itself. All right. So don't be too concerned about the fact that I'm talking about acts of parliament. I'm talking about cases. All of this you would study when you're in it proper. I'm just trying to give you, as I said, a little sneak peek, all right? So following the decision in R against Blau, the chain of causation is also satisfied, am I right? So now what are we looking for? Are there any defenses, okay? Now, you remember, why did he kill C? Why did he stab C? Because he saw, he came home and he saw C in bed with his wife. I mean, clearly they were doing the dirty, all right? So loss. Defense of loss of control, which is clearly what happened. He was provoked into killing C, or into stabbing C, I'm sorry. All right. Now, Section 54 of the Coroner's Injustice Act deals with that defense. And it says, anyone who kills, if he has lost his self-control, and if that self-loss of control has a qualifying trigger, and a person of that same circumstances would have done the same thing, you have a defense, okay? Now, unfortunately, section 55, subsection 6a says, if that thing that caused the qualifying trigger, that thing that caused you to lose your self-control is sexual infidelity, now that is to be disregarded, okay? So if we go back to our facts, why did A lose his control? Because of his wife's sexual infidelity. And section 55, subsection 6, very clearly tells us if the reason for you to have committed this offense, for you to have lost your control, is sexual infidelity, I'm sorry, it cannot be taken into account. All right? There's actually a very... Um, good reason why the law says this today and i think i'm running out of time so i can't tell you now but you know register for the program and when we actually study the coroners and justice act we will actually look at the history of the defense and to look at why sexual infidelity is something that cannot be taken into consideration when it was something that used to be taken into consideration very readily i might add okay so in this particular instance does a have a defense of loss of control Unfortunately, no. So if we're going back, okay, looking at this question, A will be convicted of murder as the causation element is satisfied. And so the actus reus and the mens rea is satisfied. There are no defenses. He cannot rely on loss of control because of section 55, subsection 6A. What does that mean? It means he will be convicted of murder. And what does that mean? It means that he will be sentenced to a mandatory life in prison. Okay? 
mandatory life imprisonment at Her Majesty's pleasure. What does that mean? It means that you will be sentenced to prison for an indefinite period of time. There's no cut. All right. For any other offences, there's usually maximum imprisonment. Maximum 10, maximum life, maximum 5. Murder is an offence that carries a mandatory life in prison. No more death penalty. In the UK, it's been abolished. So in the UK, there's no more death penalty for murder. It is a mandatory life imprisonment. All right. So that's what you do. You look at a situation, a question. You look at what are the offences? Are they satisfied? Are there any defences? And this is your conclusion. All right. So thank you very much. Okay. That's that little bit about criminal law. I hope I've piqued your interest just a little bit. And when you come in and you actually study the subject and you come onto the program, you will learn a lot more. So I started off by saying we're doing theory and it's boring. It's actually not. It's not boring. The cases are interesting. The stuff that we study is actually quite interesting. So thank you very much for listening to me. I will now let Mr. Subra talk about public law. Thank you. The world is changing exponentially. Humanity will see more changes in the next 20 years than it has in the past 300. What we do will change. How we do it, even more so. Be ready. Join the education revolution designed to impact and transform lives. Access 300 world-class programs in over 40 areas of study from over 30 international partners and affiliates in an education ecosystem like no other. Become a future-proof global graduate now. Own your future.